is. I'm sure even those Cubs fans will tell you it was worth the wait. And what a way for history to be made. Facing elimination in three straight games, winning it all on the road in extra innings to end a drought that began over 100 years ago. Let's talk to our baseball scribes about it, shall we? Jay Jaffe, Ted Keith, you guys both here to talk about a night that was just unbelievable. We know that the Cubs fans have been waiting so long for this, but where does this game, specifically Game 7, Ted, rank amongst the all-time greatest? Well, I, I want to first say that I, I think watching the Cubs win the World Series and watching some of those videos, if that doesn't make you love sports and love... <laughs> is there, is it that, a little dusty it's in here? That's why, that's why we all do what we do. That's why people watch games is, is to feel a connection and an emotion to sports and to teams like that. So it's phenomenal. And I say that in part because I don't want to dump cold water on all these people who loved it. That was not as great a game as it was a moment. It was an incredible moment, and it was an incredible game but it wasn't the best game seven ever. I don't think I'd still go 1991, 10 shutout innings until the Twins win it, maybe 2001, a one-run game uh, going into the ninth inning with a team coming from behind to win. Too many errors, too many sloppy plays, too much questionable decision-making, um, but it had all the right elements. It had the drama, it had a comeback, it had um, surprise heroes. So it was remarkable, it will never be forgotten, but if I had to pick one Game 7 over another, I wouldn't take 2016 probably. Yeah, I think it will be the most talked about Game 7 of all time, just because of the scope of, of ending the drought yeah, what and, was... and, and, and the fact that Cubs fans had been waiting so yeah. long and that you know it is such a large fan base to begin with. I think this basically will, will top the, the 1960 World Series with Bill Mazeroski hitting the walk-off home run uh, against the Yankees and you know defeating Goliath. I think this is going to replace that as, as as the one that people talk about you know a hundred years from now okay so besides the fact that it's going to be in bar conversations and thanksgiving is right uh, coming up and people are going to talk about it forever what is the lasting impact of this series and maybe of this game seven well you know i think anytime you get a, a team that hasn't been to the world series in a while and in this case we had two that hadn't been in there in a while and two that were the most two starved uh, fan bases as far as championships were concerned you bring more people to the sport because of the wider audience the more casual fans checking in and I think this one really rewarded that uh, you know you had a seven game World Series you had one of the great comebacks uh, you know from three games to one hadn't been done since 1985 hadn't been done with the winning the last two games on the road since 1979 I mean, these are hooks that, that the casual fan is going to you know is going to remember and I think that it's it it can only be great for the sport. I mean, the best TV ratings we've had in, in you know, probably the millennium or close to the turn of the millennium at least. And of course, you just have to watch all the Cubs fans celebrating to know how much this meant to those fans. We've made the entire Cubs team our adrenaline performers. It's presented by Toyota. Let's go places of all the uh, fun accolades they're going to get. Just add this one to the list. Uh, Ted, the Cubs are expected to start a very long run of dominance here. What, if anything, is standing in their way? Sorry, did you say the Cubs are expected to start a long run of dominance? Are like, they? Hang on, I'm, I'm still processing, oh, you're processing a World this, yes. Series championship, and now I have to process them being the dominant team in baseball. Oh, we're on to the yeah. day two story. No, but you're right. I mean, this is, it will not take them 108 years to win another. Oh, bold prediction no, there, yeah, <laughs> It won't take them 71 years to get to a World Series. They have every key contributor is under contract for next year. The only player I think who's even in question is Aroldis Chapman, the closer, and Dexter Fowler, the outfielder, both of whom, quite frankly, they can live without. Albert Elmore, one of the hidden heroes of yesterday's game, can replace Fowler. And as good as Chapman could be, there are guys in the bullpen and any bullpen in the major leagues who can step in and be a closer, especially if the rules of being closers are about to change. So Bryant, Rizzo, Baez, Contreras, Russell, Zobris is under control for a few more years. Hayward, who's still a great defender. That is a core of a championship team. We, we could be looking at a multi 
champion Chicago Cubs team, which I guess they're entitled to every century. They get to win a couple <laughs> yeah, I guess titles so. in a row. They'll be buying the champagne in bulk. They're going to need to go yeah. to, you know, Costco or something. Jay, what about the Indians on the other side? Are they poised for a similar run that we expect the Cubs to have? They don't have quite as strong a core. They have most most of their guys are under control for the next for the next couple of years. I think Carlos Santana is is a uh, is a free agent or at least has an option. But they're, the core of their pitching, some of which we didn't see in this series or saw only intermittently, guys like Carlos Carrasco, uh, who was out with injury, and Danny Salazar, who just did a little bit of uh, relief work, uh, along with Kluber, they've got those guys under control for at least one more run here. And I think that, you know, barring injury, they, they could be back there. The AL Central, though, they're not as far above the pack in the AL Central as the Cubs were this year in the NL Central. And it's going to be tougher for them. It's a much tougher road. The American League as a whole, you've got the Red Sox, who really are an emerging powerhouse, I think, uh, that's going that's to threaten the, the the Indians from like just taking over. So things are going to get even better for Chicago is what you're saying. Guys, it's been a very fun postseason. Lots to talk about with hot stove season going to be starting not so far from now. Jay Jaffe and Ted Key, thank you guys so much. Thank you. For more on the World Series, I'm pleased to be joined by a pitcher who won a Cy Young as a member of the Cleveland Indians. CC Sabathia joins me now. CC, you spent your first eight years of your career in Cleveland. The Indians came up just short. How do you think these players are feeling the day after? Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure it's tough. You know, especially anytime you come up, you know, a little bit short of your goal. Um, but but they they played great this year and and um, you know had a good season. And, you know, they played all the way to the end. They fought all the way to that to that last out of the ninth inning. So they have absolutely nothing that, uh, to hang their heads about. It's just, um, you know, you, they didn't get it. To, they didn't get their goal accomplished. So you know, next year um, they have a good young core, a good young team, and you know, I'm sure that's not the last that we're here. You also know what it's like to win a World Series, and you did it with the most successful franchise in baseball history, the New York Yankees. Many believe this is the beginning of a dominant run by the Cubs. What's the most difficult part of having that expectation year after year? Um, I think it's I think it's a good thing. You know, anytime you go into spring training and you know it's a legit chance you have winning the World Series, it, it makes you you know work harder and, and want to accomplish that goal. I think um, you know I think that's that's a good problem to have. You know, that's the reason why I signed over here in, in New York is you know to try to have a chance to win a championship every single year. And you know this organization over here does that. Um, does everything they can to try to put us in that position. Um, so I think it's uh, I think you have to embrace it, you know, work hard and, and don't get complacent and, and just try to keep going out and, and having a good season. Let's talk about pitching for, pitching for a moment. You were very briefly teammates with Aroldis Chapman this year. After giving up the lead in the eighth inning, he was brought to tears in the dugout. What did you think of Madden's use of Chapman in the last two games of this series? I thought, I mean, you know, obviously Chappie's a guy that wants to go out and take the ball as, as much as possible. And, and uh, you know, I think, you know, I think Madden put him in some tough situations. You know, he, you know, uh, brought him in in that game six where he probably should have, you know, kind of took him out with the five-run lead and, and uh, or maybe not even pitched him the night before. He, he would have been able to, to go out and, you know, still have his stuff. You know, I mean, if you watch last night's game, his velocity was down and, and um you know, his command was off. I think when, when you overuse like that, um, it, it's more about, you know, having your command, you know, and, and he left some pitches down in the zone that that, uh, that Davis could handle. And, you know, he's a good fastball hitter, and he, and he put one right in his happy zone. So what do you think of the managing of pitchers overall? I thought, I mean, I, it, it was tough. You know, I've never, I've never really seen, you know, um, where guys were only going, you know, four or five innings, you know, a start. You know, you know obviously, you know, that's, the strength of both of these teams, or that's the strength of the Indians anyway, was their bullpen. So they were just trying to, 
get the lead and get to that bullpen as quick as possible. CC, we know it may be the off season for you, but you're putting in work with your charity, the Pitchin Foundation. Two big fundraisers coming up. The New York City Marathon is this Sunday, and of course your annual holiday party for the Boys and Girls Club takes place in December. Can you tell us about these two events? Yeah, we're excited. This is, uh, you know, something that we've been doing with the with the marathon team is, um, you know, being able to go out and cheer, cheer the guys on. Um, tomorrow we have um, our big carb load dinner where me and Amber go out and, you know, give give uh, the runners encouragement. You know, it's, it's been a lot of fun. You know, Amber ran a marathon two years ago and, um, you know, just watching her go through that process and all the training and stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun to be a part of it. You know, if we can go out and cheer for these, uh, for the for the runners for us, um, you know, raise the money for our foundation, it, it's great. I'll tell you, I'll be in for the carb load. I don't know if I'd be in for the marathon. <laughs> what about you? <laughs> Me either. I, definitely, I could not. You know, that's something that I, I would never, ever try to do. Um, I know Tiki's, he's ran it for us the last three years, and, um, you know, that's that's just taxing. I, I, don't, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I, I like to be at the finish line and, and greet people when they come across the line. I feel you there. Of course, Amber, your lovely wife, Tiki Barber, former Giants running back who is running the marathon. Of course, you can go to pitch.org. That's P-I-T-C-C-H to find more info. CC Sabathia, thanks so much for joining us and uh, have fun this off season and with your big events coming up soon. Thank you. Thank you. Sad question to ask, but one that's valid. Our resident Cleveland fan is here. Mark Bechtel, also the managing editor of SI for Kids. Hope that one didn't send you right to the ledge, Mark. But is this the worst loss in Cleveland Indians history? Um, Not for me, strangely enough. I mean, obviously you're up 3-1. It'd be nice to close the deal. But just what this team did was so improbable and it just it felt like it was this bubble that just kept getting bigger and bigger you know you lose Michael Brantley at the start of the year and then you have two of your three best starters go down so basically they went into the playoffs you know knocked off two of the the best offenses in the league and then you know it finally burst because they're rotation was you know a guy with nine and a half fingers and then a guy who <laughs> the pitched, drone a guy who pitched every third day and yeah. then Josh Tomlin on short rest and it just it just caught up with them and it's you know it obviously it's it's it feels like a little bit of a sucker punch when you're up 3-1 and you can't close the deal but um, it's just hard for me to feel really bad about this team because the expectations um, I think were they, they certainly weren't low, but I don't think anyone expected them to be up 3-1 okay, in the series. But you know Cleveland fans. You know Indian fans. Are you the outlier? How are the other Indians fans feeling today? Are they feeling devastated? I, I don't. I don't. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I personally and, you know, a few buddies I've talked to, everybody sort of feels like it was a great run. And obviously, you know, you sort of get used to having these bad things happen. But, you know, I think part of it, the fact that the Cavs won, that helps a little bit because, 
fine. The city's championship drought is, you know, it's four and a half months now, which is a lot better than 52 and a half years. So, you know, it's, it's hard to feel too, too bad. In terms of likability, where does this Cleveland Indians team rank for you? For, this was the most fun I've ever had as a fan following a team. Um, even more fun than the Cavs. Even more fun than the Cavs. I, um, you know, just the they have a payroll of under $100 million, and they're going up there against, you know, against these juggernauts. And they, you know, they, they just, they're, they're young and, and hungry. And, you know, it seemed like everybody, like every regular except, you know, for the catchers and Rajay Davis had, like, the best year of their career. And it, everybody just sort of, everything just came together in a great way. And like I said, it just, it, it, it sort of built into this bubble, and you were like, please just make it through, make it through October. And, Actually, it did, and then it got to November, and that's when things went south. But um, I, to me, it's just it was a great team to follow all year. Yeah, you don't have to cry because it's over. You can just smile because it happened, Mark. Although you Thank don't you. smile very often, I, so win or lose. I did. I was, they, yeah. I think Eighth maybe inning, we saw I was smiling last night. I was smiling the, last night. Once the Indians made it to the World Series, I believe we saw us, Mark. Listen, Mark Bechtel, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your uh, trials and tribulations as a Cleveland. It's, it's, I've got plenty of them, so whenever <laughs> you need them. It's a deep well to draw. It is. Thank you. Thanks. the series has been up and down and and then game seven here um, the elation of getting up early in the game and feeling like we we have the game in our grasp and then um, it getting away in the bottom of the eighth and then uh, having a little rain delay and coming back and scoring those two in the tenth man uh, it was just an epic battle you know we've been listening to uh, Rocky <laughs> Rocky's soundtrack the last three games before the you know we've got our own Italian stallion Anthony Rizzo that's been putting that on and uh, <clears throat> is like a heavyweight fight, man. Uh, just uh, blow for blow, everybody uh, playing playing their heart out. And, you know, the Indians never gave up either. And, and um, you know, I, I can't believe we're finally standing, and after 108 years, finally able to um, hoist the trophy. How about that? The Cubs using the eye of the tiger. Not bad. Let's check in with our own Ben Ryder, who was covering the series in both Chicago and also Cleveland. Ben, it's been a long couple days for you. We know the Cubs. They were just mired in mediocrity for so long. What were the key steps in Theo Epstein turning this club around? I think, Maggie, if you had to point to one in his five years, it came in December 2014. That was when they signed John Lester. Now, we don't remember, we don't quite remember it now, but this was a real surprise. The Giants were after him. The Red Sox were after him. Those two teams were the teams that had won four of the previous five World Series. The Cubs, meanwhile, had had five straight losing seasons and had won 73 games the year before. Now, of course, $155 million dollars they offered to Lester over six years help, but so did the plan they outlined for him. They said, look, trust us. And obviously Lester knew Theo Epstein and Jed Hoyer in the front office. Trust us. Look at these young guys we have that are going to be an incredible nucleus. Trust us to add the right veterans, not just you, but the right veterans, veterans surrounding you. By 2015, uh, we should be better. By 2016, we're going to be contenders. You know, never before has a sales pitch come so exactly true, Maggie. Okay, and what about 2017, 18, 19? You don't want to be counting the rings before they're won, but what does the future hold for the Cubs? It's extremely scary for the rest of the league. It really is. We know things can go wrong, Maggie. I mean, let's look at the Nationals. This is a team we thought might be a dynasty. They have not done it yet. Look at even last year's Royals. Looks like they'd be around for a long time kind of had a nightmarish type of season this year as far as 
fall off in performance and injury. But the Cubs' situation is just so overwhelming. It's hard to believe that they're not going to be back here again and again. This offseason, obviously, David Ross is retiring. Dexter Fowler might opt out of his contract. They're really not losing much. In fact, they're not going to be losing many key pieces for years and years. You look at that great young infield, Anthony Rizzo, Javier Baez, Chris Bryant, Addison Russell, Wilson Contreras, even Kyle Schwarber. These guys are all under team control through 2021. That's five years from now. Man, this is going to be a team to reckon with for a long time. Good times are coming to Chicago. Well, they're here, maybe here to stay. Uh, ben, a lot of people were talking about Terry Francona, that he could be heading to the Hall of Fame as a manager. But what about Joe Madden? What did this win do for his legacy? <laughs> it did a lot. And I'm amazed at how close his legacy was from being the complete opposite. Really, it's about one swing away. This guy would go from a sports hero to really a ghost, you know, in Chicago uh, for some of the decisions that he made last night and the night before, really, using a real this Chapman and then throwing him out there again when he seemed gassed. You know, the frankly bizarre two-strike bunt by Javier Baez in the ninth inning with a man on third and one out. That's one that I'll never have explained to me in years and years and years. All, that's all it takes, though. There's little flips uh, in the outcome. Obviously, it worked out, and now he's a guy that will be remembered forever in Chicago in a good way. Could have been the other. He could have been the managerial apartment in Chicago if this thing hadn't worked out the way it did. That is the worst moniker you could ever assign to somebody. <laughs> uh, ben, you were around all this crazy champagne celebration. You've been around them before. Did it feel different, though, being in that Cubs clubhouse? Mm, you know, I think not for the team. I think that that was really the secret uh, to this team all along. You know, they were not thinking about 108 years. It had no bearing on what they were trying to do here as well as shouldn't. And that was kind of Joe Madden's message. You know, every team that wins the World Series uh, is elated. It seems to everybody as if they've broken a curse the first time they win that. Uh, so I really saw the same level of excitement, of relief, of everything in that clubhouse uh, that I have before. I suppose if there was a little extra edge, it was just because of the virtually unbelievable way in which they won it, coming back from 3-1 down. Um, and then saving off, ultimately, the serious Indians comeback last night. Yeah, absolutely. And it's fun to watch that footage. Um, final one for you. Turning to Cleveland, their drought continues. Will they now be the most scrutinized team in baseball? Or do you think fans will turn their attention elsewhere? Maybe Bryce Harper and Mike Trout looking for their first rings. I think it's probably the Indians now. It was like in a blink of an eye, you know, the title of hex holders went to the Indians, and they literally did, right? They're now all of a sudden the holder of the longest championship drought in America's pastime. You know, the good news for the Indians is that they're pretty well set up going forward, too, uh, just like the Cubs are. The only guy who's really a major free agent for them going into next year is Mike Napoli. Uh, the rest of their guys, especially the starting Staff is under control through 2020. Obviously, Francisco Lindor is going to be around for a long time. We should see them back again as well. You know, it's unlikely that there will be a rematch a year from now, but it's certainly possible. Well, the World Series certainly delivered this year. Ben Ryder, uh, great job throughout the postseason. We appreciate you joining us. I'm sure you're low on sleep, but thank you. Thanks, Maggie. All right. And that's going to do it for this post-World Series edition of SI Now. Congratulations to all the Cubs and their fans, and we will see you tomorrow.